What's up guys, greetings from Singapore. My name is Gareth Emery and this is episode four of Make It Happen, how to make it in the music industry. So a few weeks back, I visited Icon Collective, which is an electronic music production school located in Los Angeles. They do a lot of amazing work. And um, I did a one hour Q&A session with the um, current students there. Um, we covered some really interesting topics like how you can find your creative focus, the right time to get an agent or manager, and what it's like to play EDC. So um, that is today's episode. It's a little bit longer than our normal episodes, but um, do go with it. There's definitely some gold in there once things get warmed up. So um, enjoy today's episode and make it happen. Hope you find some fire in there. And uh, for the next episode, I'm going to be taking your questions. So do send them to me, gareth at garethemory.com or hashtag make it happen on Twitter. Right now, we head to Icon Collective in Los Angeles. Let's do this. Um, all right, so I think what we'll do today is I'm going to talk for like just five minutes about like how I got where I am. A very quick sort of potted story. It's going to be a little bit different to the usual story you hear about how somebody made it. Then after we've done that, we're going to do questions for the rest of it. Sound good? Yes, awesome. Sir. I've got a couple of notes. I'm weirdly, weirdly nervous, right? I can like go and like <laughs> walk out to like fucking 50,000 people at like Electric Daisy Carnival, no problem. But put me in a room when I have to talk, so it's, it's a different story. <laughs> so, so I've been in dance music full time since 2002. And when I first got into it, I was 22 years old. And I kind of blew up initially. I made one record which became kind of the biggest trance record of the year. And at that point, it was like, it got me loads of hype. And you're going to be amazed that this is how things were, because it was done on a laptop. Because nobody made music on laptops back then. In fact, nobody really made music on computers. I mean, you use the computer as your door, but you had to have a shitload of synths and stuff to go with it. Like, soft synths were way worse back then than they were now. So for me, I kind of got double pressed, because A, I was 22, which was considered well young then. Now it's like fucking old, right? 22 is. Kind Kind of like the, <laughs> the upper age limit. So at that point, it was really, oh, thank you so much. So at that point, I was considered super young. Plus the fact I made music on a laptop got me loads of, of hype. And it's amazing for me to see how things have changed so much since then, right? Fast forward on 50, 15 years, and everyone that blows up is firstly, they're way younger than 22, and secondly, they're only using laptops. Like, if somebody has their first hit record now, and they're 35 years old, and they've got a studio, we'd go like, well, what the fuck have you been doing for the last 15 years? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was kind of a high barrier to entry at that point, because everyone making music had been doing it for like 20 years. Everyone making at least electronic music was in their mid-30s. They all had like 50 grand studios, so it was, it was a high barrier to entry. So I made this record, got loads of press, loads of hype, and basically blew up really quickly. All of a sudden, I was in like every dance music magazine, every club I'd ever wanted to play booked me in like a six-month period. It was literally like career went from nothing to everything in a very short space of time. And I was like, amazing, I fucking made it. Um, and I assumed that would be my life for the next 20 years, and, and there you go. What I didn't realise was you had to carry on making hit records, and one is, was, was not enough. So, you know, I had one great year, then the year after that, I was like, hey, I want to go play all those same places again that I just played, and all those same festivals, and instead of wanting to book me, they were booking whoever had made the hit record that year. Go a year on, we're in 2004, and then I've got two more years of people that have made hit records instead of me. So essentially my career started fucking plateauing and then going down. And in 2006, I was on the verge of giving it up. I had one kind of like really tough, like three months where I didn't do a single show. I was living in my parents' house. I was making music in my bedroom. And for three months, I didn't have a gig. And this wasn't like I was taking time off to make music. There was just nobody that wanted to book me. And every day I'd phone up my agent and go, dude, like I need some fucking gigs. I've literally got no money. And he was like, well, you live with your mum and dad, really. So you don't need much money. And, uh, <laughs> he's, he's like, you know what? You haven't made a record. You haven't made a good record for two years. He said, I've been kind of shoving you down people's throats. You know, they've been booking you when they really want to. And he said, we've, we've kind of just run out of options. So I was 25 at that point. Um, 
I'd been to university, I had a good degree, so going in the, re the, the regular career route was still kind of an option for me. All of my buddies were making like 100 grand, 200 grand in these like banking jobs. And I was thinking like, shit, man, like I've like wasted like fucking the best, you know, half my life doing this shit. Maybe it's time to go and knock it on the head. And I was getting all this like negative shit in my head, like it wasn't for me, I'd done my best. And every friend and family member I spoke to, apart from one, said the same thing. They're like, you know what? Yeah, you're a wicked DJ, but like you've been doing this for four years and you haven't managed to leave home yet. So, yeah, it probably is time you went and got a job. So I started looking for jobs to apply for and I was that fucking close um, to, to giving up. And then one day, like my, my dad said to me, he was like, and he'd never been the most enthusiastic supporter, but he was like, what are you doing? He was like, you're so lazy. He said, you've, you've barely given this a shot. And obviously I reacted like, I was like, what? I was like, how can you say this? I work so hard. And he was like, you sit in front of a computer all day. He goes, you don't actually do any work. He said, you're there on like message boards and kind of the, what came before social media. And I was really pissed with him at the time, but he was telling the truth. And I decided to give myself six months to try and turn that shit around. Now, you can't do a lot in six months. Music industry, as you've kind of probably worked out already, is not the fastest moving place when it comes to releases and stuff like that. But you can definitely plant some seeds which will later become like trees. So I started my podcast in 2006. We did one episode every week from 2006 to 2014 when we changed it to Electric for Life and Electric for Life sold out the shrine in Los Angeles last year. So 10 years on, like that's where it started and that's, um, and, and, that, and that's where it got to. So like, I guess part of the reason, I've been doing a podcast, another one called Make It Happen, which is what we're filming today, which is purely about giving people advice to make it in the music business. And what I kind of feel is missing in terms of the advice that like a lot of people get. I think we're really good at telling people how to produce music. Production tutorials, like sound on sound, like look, whenever there's something I wanna know, look on YouTube, it's probably gonna be there. But when, that's only kind of half the struggle. When it comes to navigating the industry itself, that's a whole different ball game. And I think there's a real lack of quality information out there about how to handle the industry. And for me, I think part of the reason is, like guys like me who have like on paper like made it to some extent tend to give very sanitized short stories about how they became successful for instance i didn't tell that story i've just told you until about 12 months ago normally people would say how did you do what you've done i'd go yeah i made a record it did well and then i've been doing this i've been doing this ever since um i think what you also find is a lot of people who are kind of in the place where i am now don't have an interest in the younger generation becoming too successful. Like they'll want you guys to make a record. They wanna make a record on their, on their record label. They won't necessarily want you to make 10 massive fucking hits because then you're gonna be above them on the flyer. So I think that's the way a lot of people look at it. Like essentially they will wanna have, and it's just in a self, it's not in a fucking nasty way, but it's self preservation. They'll look to put a glass ceiling um, under people who are kind of coming up in the world. Now, like for me, I don't really see it that way. And part of the reason I try and give like every bit of knowledge I've got back, you know, I've made fucking thousands of mistakes over the years. I've learned an awful lot of lessons. And these are lessons like I want to share with people. I didn't have like a mentor or anybody like that when I was starting out. I had nobody to tell me about the pitfalls to avoid, the mistakes I shouldn't make. And that meant I learned everything by making mistakes. I fucked up, I learned, and then I did things differently the next time. If I'd known like 15 years ago what I knew now, I would have probably got to where I'm sitting now after like six years instead of 15 years. So essentially like if I can like pass that wisdom on to other people and prevent them fucking up when I fucked up. Because I think the fundamentals of the business are still, are still pretty much the same. Um, that for me is, is, is kind of a job well done. Um, I think the other thing like as well is, this is a, it's a really fucking hard industry. And even with every bit of knowledge that I've got to give, it's still fucking hard. Like I can give people the exact roadmap 
everything I've done. There's no fucking secret. There'll be nothing held back. I don't know if any of you guys have watched the Make It Happen podcast. Like, we hold nothing back. Like, literally, I will explain every fucking thing I've ever done in my life and, and, and why I did it. It's still pretty fucking difficult. And, you know, you've still got to be incredibly hardworking to make it. So, you know, for me, that's, it's kind of, I feel good about, about passing on, passing on the wisdom. So, um, I think that is essentially it. So what I want to do today is open up to questions. And to, to be honest, like I kind of feel where I can give you guys the most value is probably on the industry side of things. Like as a music producer, like, I don't think I'm the greatest producer out there. Like my strengths are mainly songwriting and having a decent instinct for what the crowd want to hear. On a technical level, I'd learn more from you guys, I imagine, if we're talking about fucking plugins and doors and shit like that. Like feel free to ask me about that stuff and I'll answer as honestly as I can. But when it comes to the technical side of music production, you're probably already a few steps ahead of me. When it comes to the industry and following your fucking goals and getting the dream in your head to become a reality and the day-to-day -day practices you need to make that happen, like, I'm probably your guy. So, um, there you go. That's me. Um, I've spoken a little bit longer than I thought. So, let's have a talk and do some questions. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, I'm trying to be a songwriter as well. Yeah. And I was kind of curious, I mean, Sometimes you just get that like that boost, and you're like, "Oh, this is it," and just like flows. But, yeah. Like, what is your daily like routine to like practice the art of songwriting? Um, it's identifying what gets you in that zone, and then trying to replicate it. Because you obviously know that sometimes you're in the zone, and it's just amazing and beautiful, and creativity flows out of you. And sometimes it's like swimming through shit; it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to work out like whatever gets you in the zone and do that like i'll tell you what it is for me it may not be the same for you for me i find like the kind of grind of the music industry i.e emails festival billings fees social media all that bullshit highly distractive when it comes to creating art so for me to work well in the studio if i'm doing a day in the studio i don't check my emails in the morning i don't look at social media at all my phone is on airplane mode and it doesn't come off airplane mode until i've done that studio session because i find the kind of hum of the world and looking at all the other shit what other people are doing is pretty distracting for me so because what will happen is i'll be like halfway through making a track and then i'll hit like a little bit of a creative slow point. I'll pick up my phone, I'll look on Twitter, there's some festival I wanna be on that I'm not playing. I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna call my agent and find out why I'm not in that festival. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the studio session is, is blown. And I think if you take away those distractions, you're much more likely to work through the times when you hit like a bit of a creative roadblock. But it's really about like finding what, I'm not saying that's gonna be the answer for you or anybody else, that's what works for me. So it's finding what makes you it's having the self-awareness to know what gets you in the zone and then attempting to replicate that when it's time to write music. Mm. Yeah. How important is uh, branding to you and what does it mean for you? I think it's important at like a certain level. I think like many things in electronic music, it's probably been overstated. I think a lot of these things, and branding is, is a great example, was powerful for those people that had first mover advantage. Because 15 years ago, DJs didn't have branding. They didn't have logos. If they had a press shot, they were fucking lucky. So when the first DJs decided, hey, so, so it was a case of like, whenever Tiesto did a show 15 years ago, the graphic designer just wrote Tiesto in whatever font he liked, and that was the flyer. And then say like, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, and I think Tiesto probably was the first to go, I'm gonna be a brand. I'm gonna create a logo. And for him, as the first mover, that was really fucking powerful. Now, every DJ in the world has branding. I mean, like, how many of you guys have logos? Like, I'm just interested to know, like, like show of hands? See, that's interesting, right? Like, like, like nearly half ev everybody in this room. So even, like, people whose, you know, careers are not at a Tiesto level have branding and logos. And generally, the more people do anything, like, in the industry, the less its impact kind of is. So almost these days, like I kind of think there'd be more value in going, you know what, I'm anti-branding, I'm not gonna have a fucking logo. Everyone has a logo, just do it whatever the way you want. You know, I, th I think you've always gotta look to do things for the right reasons. So 
if you decide to create yourself a brand and a logo and all that stuff, know why you're doing it. So if it's a case of, hey, I'm playing 30 headline shows this year and I want to make sure there's a consistent brand, that's a reason to do it. To go, hey, I'm going to have a brand because having a brand is what you do. I don't know why, but it's what everybody else does. That's not a reason to do it. So it's important and it's a good thing when it's done for the right reasons. That answer it, or you, did you? Did you have anything? That was great. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. So uh, I know you said, like, right before we started taking questions, you said like stuff day to day things. So for you, what might be some like day to day things that kind of overall improve your process, whether it be the songwriting or production or? Um, in terms of making music or just living life in I general? Just living life in general, which does I mean I guess can relate to music as well. I mean, again, like like for me. Um, making sure my time spent in the online world is is carefully monitored is really fucking important now again I, I can tell you how it is for me it may not apply to all of you but when it comes to me i find social media really fucking addictive um like it's and there's a lot of reasons why it is that way and i'm not going to go and spend a long time talking about them but if you look them up there's a lot written about it but like essentially there's a chemical called dopamine in our brains which is released every time you get a notification or a pop-up and that chemical becomes very addictive and it's easy to become addicted to direct messages and out replies and, and, and likes and stuff like that and there was a period where I'd say for about three or four years of my life my musical output was you know two tracks a year it was terrible and I was successful right? I was doing 120 shows a year I was all you know I was traveling all over the world but I wasn't fucking creating music and creating music was one of the main reasons I got into this right it's about making music and playing music and, and really not much else and the reason why was because I was spending probably when you added it all together six hours of my day doing social media um, and it wasn't until I was like, fuck, like, if I can reduce this, I can probably free up a little bit more, more time in the studio. So for me, I try and use social media for outgoing communication. So when there's a message I have to send to the world, that's when I use it. But what I try to avoid doing is like mindless feed scrolling, because that's what takes your day up, right? When you're sad, you, you probably all know what it's like, right? You're a bit tired, you fucking pick up your phone, and before you know it, you've been like, <laughs> And like the hours just 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 fucking just, just fucking disappear so i'm very caref careful not and by the way like this is the default setting for 98 percent of people on this planet because like look at the world around you just people in public the leading cause of death in the world right now is people getting knocked over in the road because they're looking at their fucking phones like how fucking crazy <laughs> is that like these apps are so fucking addictive and it's in the palm of your hand and you just like you'll see see people out for dinner and both people are just there like looking at their phones basically about 90 percent of like people in our society are mindlessly addicted to these things and they don't even fucking realize it so i'm not saying don't use them because there's very very good ways to use social media to, to help your your career but if you realize that limiting your use can have benefits you've immediately got a massive competitive advantage over everybody else that just picks it up and goes doo, 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 doo. so basically that's thing one i don't use social media that much and i mainly use it to send out content rather than to read what everybody else is posting um structure is really important like i have a, a to-do list every day which is never many like i call it power list right it's not a lot of items it's usually about three fucking things but basically those things get done before my phone comes off airplane mode. Because what I know is if I wake up and the first thing I do is go to my emails or go to my socials, the whole day will disappear based on other people's agenda. Like I look at my emails, there's always a hundred of, of them in there and there's always people going, yo, you've got to do this interview and you're supposed to do this. And is there any chance you can um, call this radio station? And can you make a radio edit? It's, all, it's basically like my day will get dragged around by everybody else so the way i tend to do it is block the world out wake up focus on whatever i'm focusing on if it's making music it's making music if it's family stuff it's family stuff but basically i'm all in with zero distractions on whatever i'm doing until the power list is done and like i say it's normally only two or three items 
doesn't take a long time to do, but they're things I would put off all day long if I would allow myself to. So um, I'd say organization, not interacting too much with the outside world. There's other things I'd use, like I'm, I'm in the last, but like, I'm always trying to self-improve, <laughs> right? For me, it's kind of like, it's a work in progress. I've been trying to figure out better ways of being better at my job and better at creating for the last like 10 years. So I've got really into meditation in the last 10 years. That's been super powerful, amazing in getting that creative focus. But um, yeah, those are some of the main kind of tools that I use. Yeah. How do you go about composing a new track? Like, do you have a certain workflow? To me, it almost always starts with a melody because I'm a melody guy. So like I love writing melodies when it comes, and I love writing like a demo, right? So I can write a melody, I'll arrange it, and I'll have a really good demo within about two hours. That bit I love. The process of taking that demo to the finished thing, I don't particularly enjoy, in all, in all honesty, mm -hmm. because I feel like my strength is melody and it's songs. And speaking frankly, if there was an engineer that was as good at producing the finished track as I was, he'd be on my payroll. But we've tried using, I've tried using co-producers before and I've never really found the results of being as I wanted them to be. And I ended up spending a lot longer trying to get the right result than if I just fucking done it myself. So now I'm like, you know what, I don't really enjoy finishing the track, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it happen. So um, that's my process, right? You know, I've got other buddies who like, what they fucking love is making synths and making kick drums and making like dope sounding beats. But sometimes the melody for them is a bit of a struggle. Okay. If you love writing melodies and you're great at writing them and you equally love the process of engineering a track and finishing it, well then you're in a very, you're in a very good position. Yeah, because that's how I start. I'll start with a melody, chord, yeah. space, and then I'll just start the track. Yeah, I, I also, you know, for me, there's kind of a good advantage to arranging a track before you've heard it too much. The arrangement is something I find I'm much better doing when the track is fresh to me. So I try and do an arrangement, like my range, like my two hour demos, they'll sound like fucking shit, but the arrangement will almost never change from the finished track. Because when the track is fresh in my head and I'm still excited about the melody, I can make a great like club friendly arrangement. Whereas if I go and like spend like a whole day doing a groove, for instance, I've heard it so fucking much and then I've lost that perspective of how an arrangement should look. So I think particularly for you, if you work in a similar way to me, look at the arrangement first, get the arrangement done, get the melody done and even like yeah, like make a demo make a two hour demo export it like it won't sound use the most easy to reach sounds you have um and then you've got it there stick it in an itunes um playlist which i do and then sometimes i'll go and go how many demos have i made like what's decent what is going to be a good one to turn into a finished track but um yeah arrangement of melody please that's awesome thank I'll you do first uh yeah yeah when you made that first like hit record yeah um, how did you deal with those limitations of not having those that gear and everything else people have? Oh, it, it was an advantage, to be honest. Um, I, so I was using a sequencer called Acid, which I doubt exists anymore, and one soft scene, that's all I had, called, I think it was called Orion. And basically, they didn't even work together, so I had to export audio from the soft synth and then arrange it in Acid, which was only an arranger. It didn't have like VSTs or, or anything like that. but. Because I was so limited, and the sound cell I had was incredibly limited, I couldn't make these lush kind of flowing, like soundscapes I wanted to. All I had was electro sounds because I was using one fucking synth, kind of like using the subtractive synth in Reason. Like that's the sort of like 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 sound sound cell I had, and it kind of meant that I made this really fucking cool electro influenced track, which was different to what everybody else was making. Everyone else was making these super lush fucking layered textured things because they could. I didn't have the ability to make that. Not that I knew at this point, right? This is all with, with hindsight. So I made something incredibly basic. And I think part of the reason why it took me so long to follow that record up was because I got a large publishing advance after it. I went and bought a studio. I went and bought fucking five synths, a proper door, Cubase, and then I had all the fucking choice in the world. But my production ability and my like songwriting ability was not really at a level to deal with having that much choice. So the music I made for the next four years basically fucking sucked. So to be honest, I think it's more difficult to know what to leave in when you have the choice of everything rather than just having something very limited and I actually think a great way to 
um, to work on, on certain bits of your skill set is to limit what you're using and go, I'm going to make something just using one fucking synth. That doesn't need to be the finished thing, but it can be amazing for musical focus when you don't have a lot of production choice. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do you write every day, and how big a role do you think repetition plays in improving songwriting? Uh, no, I'd say I probably write like three to four days a week. I mean, a lot of it depends. Like when I'm in album mode, and I'm in like the six months before releasing an album, then it's every day. And if it's not writing, if I'm traveling for shows, I'll have my laptop and I'll, and I'll be finishing stuff. But then, you know, right now, for instance, like my album has been released, my music for the rest of the year is is pretty much done. So I, at the moment, it's probably like like two days a week. So there's a few other projects I'm working on. One is um, uh, we have a little fictional alter ego uh, called CVNT5. One or two of you might have seen the, the music video we did. Um, if not, it's it's funny to some people, um, but anyways, we're we're making <laughs> we're making it into like a little bit of a documentary TV series. So right now, I'm not writing music, but I'm writing scripts for that. So if I don't do something creative in a day, that day feels like a failure, whether it's music or or writing a script. Um, repetition is really fucking important though, and especially when you're working on a big project, being able to find a daily routine that works for you, that you can then duplicate, is, um, is, is really fucking powerful. And most, particu like most particular is the morning routine. The first things you do when you get out of bed in the morning, and it comes right down to the information that you put in your head from the moment you fucking get up. So, again, everybody's got things that work for that works for them and, and doesn't work for them. Like for me, putting the right shit in my head from the moment I get up, like listening to something fucking motivational gets me motivated for the day. Looking on Instagram at, you know, say, say I, I, am, I don't use social media in the morning, but if I did, there's certain Instagram accounts I would look at, motivational ones, that would get me ready for the fucking day and get me ready to go and crush it. There's other ones, like Kim Kardashian, that would make me feel poor and ugly. So, I'd, I'm very, it's essentially like the information you put into your brain is like the fuel you put into a fucking car. It's extremely fucking important. That's one part of the morning routine. For me, exercise is also really fucking useful. I find if I can exercise in the first like hour or so of a day, that will get my day going well. And when I was finishing my last album, I had a great fucking routine. It helped that I wasn't touring that much, so I could literally do the same thing five days a week, and um, that worked out really well. Like now, because I'm on a serious tour, like doing you know like like 14, 15 shows every month, I'm always travelling, so no day is really the same. And this is a lot more difficult to have a decent routine when when you're travelling. That's a challenge that kind of comes, I, I guess, with with success. But when you have the ability to program every day in the same way, I would strongly recommend you do it. It's powerful shit. Uh, yes. Um, how were you like? Um persistent when you felt like giving up during those like 10 years because I remember you made a Facebook post about that as well yeah um, that's an interesting one at some point I wasn't like I, I don't want to sound like I've always had this insane fucking drive because there are points when I really wanted to fucking give up and you know there are times now when things don't go to plan and it pisses me off and I think it's important to know that everyone, from the biggest artist in the world to somebody who's just starting out, has times when the industry will take a shit on them and they'll want to get under the fucking covers and pull the duvet over their heads and not do anything that day. Like, we all go through that shit. That's my experience, but it's also my experience from talking to the Armin's and Tiestos and Dead Mouse of that world. It's something everybody deals with. Everybody deals with. So. The key is really how you respond to it, as opposed to, is it gonna to happen to you or not? Because it's definitely gonna to happen to you. And it used to be the case that if something happened, like it would throw me off for fucking days. Like it would blow, like I'd not wanna make, say if something, I don't know, if there was something I was expecting to get, like a festival I was expecting to play, and then I'm told at like 10 o'clock in the morning, yeah, you've been kicked off or you're not playing it, that's just one example. You know, that's tough, right? It's a massive fucking blow to your ego. Um, and that could knock me off my stride for a couple of days. Now, it's five minutes. Like, I'm able to turn that around very, very quickly. So, 
I wouldn't say I've ever, you know, it's not like I've become less sensitive to this shit. Like when, when the world takes a shit on you, it's still tough, but you can dramatically lower your response time in how quickly you can bounce back and how you can use that shit as, as fucking fuel. Everything bad that happens to you, there's usually a way you can look at it that you can kind of turn it around and use it as basically fire to go to go and be fucking better. So it does. You don't learn how to do that overnight. You have you have to practice it. Practice it. But that that's something I've I've become pretty good at over the years. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, really big fan of your work. Thank uh, you. Your your albums are just absolutely as far as sound design and. They're really good. Um, Thank actually, you. Actually, I was I studied in Southampton. Oh, in uh, UK. Engineering, yeah, in the UK. Wow, how did you find it? It's my hometown. How did you find yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm half Spanish, half American, and uh, I went to the UK to study sound engineering, and it was really cool because like everyone was kind of doing a little bit of everything music wise. Yeah. But but what I'm asking is how how do you like stand by your music even though like you hear something and someone else will like drum a bass or or stuff like that, you know? No, that's a really good question. And, yeah. and, and to be honest, it's one, I, it's, it's one I still struggle with now because like I, like, I don't know, I imagine a lot of people are like this. I hear something that's really fucking cool, yeah. especially if it's something new, and I want to make something like that. So like, for instance, when Kygo first emerged, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like I'd hear that sound, oh, that's fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Let's go and make something like that. But then you don't want to fall into the trap of always aping whatever the current trend is. Right, you've got to find your own sound and stick by it. And I, I think that's just the case of like, for me, it was making mistakes and making music that sound like other people and then getting shit feedback when everybody went, why are you copying, not Kygo, because I never, I'd learned the lesson by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like, why are you copying fucking Dead Mouse? Just do your fucking thing. We like what you do. Yeah. So for me, that was just a case, case of lessons. And also, like, also realizing you don't need to be as good at as good a progressive as Dead Mouse is, or as good as Tropical as Kygo is, or as good at fucking techno as Loco Dice is. Like we don't need to be everybody. Jim. We just need to be us, who we are. You only need to be good at one fucking thing, one style, and one uh, and one sound. Now. There's definitely times when you want to experiment and there's definitely creative ways of taking influence from somebody else's music and using it in a positive way. I just think there's a fine line between taking a bit of inspiration and copying a sound and you always want to stay on the on the right side of that of that line. Thank you. Yeah, it's not it's not easy and that's why <laughs> there's no easy answer because it's yeah. not because it's not easy and it's trial and error yeah. and it's experimentation and um, it's finding it's finding your sound and, and your place in the industry and for some people it happens very quickly to others it takes time. Yeah. Cuz in Bedford place it wasn't the easiest thing. It was like you have to play house. It's like okay. Yeah, there's not yeah. much call there's not much call for trance in Southampton. That's yeah, why I don't, that's why I don't live there anymore. <laughs> But Bedford Place is a nice place to live, though. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Uh, or I don't know if it was uh, Orange Rooms by the time you were there, but I love the Orange Rooms. Yeah, dude. I've had many, many good nights in there, and, and many I don't remember that well. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Go for it. So I'm curious, what's your musical background? Like, do you play instruments? Yeah, I mean, I I have reasonable like musical DNA. Um, as, as I'd call it, and I'm not gonna, I'm not, but I'm not saying this is something you fucking need. I very much think you don't. A lot of people who don't have it are as good at doing music as me. But I, I was always able to play the piano. Weirdly enough, we had one in the house. Nobody else played it. Like my parents didn't really play it, and I was, I had this bizarre ability to be able to listen to a song and, and play it, just playing by ear basically. So I was like a party trick. Like my parents would have friends around and they'd go, name a song and he'll play it. And they'd go, I don't know, Beethoven's Fifth. And I'd play, not like to Beethoven level, obviously, I'd play the shitty one finger version of it. <laughs> but it was, you know, yeah. in a suburb of Stanton, UK, it was still impressive. Yeah. There weren't many fucking virtuosos around there, so you didn't need to be one. Um, <laughs> so then I, I was forced through uh, like classical training, all that shit. Never enjoyed it, but my mum made me do it. Um, so I did that stuff. And then I taught myself guitar, played in a band for a couple of years. So I have like a decent background with with like real instruments. Um, the one thing I'll say is though, like when it, when it came to writing electronic music, I had to unlearn that shit. 
because a conventional musical training, particularly classical music, is about playing things their way. There's not scope for doing your own interpretation of a piece of music. Like if you're entering a fucking piano competition, which I used to be sent in to play, I never won one by the way, to play a Mozart piece, and you do it differently to how Mozart did it, that's not a good thing. Like they want you to play it exactly the same as how it's written on the paper, and that's it. So when it came to dance music, I was like, fuck, like, everything doing well here is original, and it's not the same as everything else, it's different. So I literally had to unlearn that shit. I know um, I spoke to uh, Zed about this, and he said it was exactly the same for him. He literally had to cast aside that kind of, um, that musical background. So yes, I did have it. Um, how advantage advantageous it was, I'm not sure. Definitely not as much as most people would assume, I think. Yes. So I know it's not your style, but what do you think about dubstep? Um, you know what? When it first came out, I fucking loved it. Like when Skrillex like first appeared, it was like it was just so fresh, man. And, and I'd watched the UK, the like the original dubstep with like Burial and guys like that, which was like what came before Skrillex, which I kind of liked. And then the American dubstep just completely fucking took it to the next level. And there was, I, there was a point when I'd drop like Skrillex tracks in my set, so I was just that excited about it. And you can imagine how the trans fans reacted to that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we only had one sit down protest, <laughs> but like we actually, I remember like the, the, because people knew I people knew I played this stuff, and there was one night at Ministry of Sound when people said to me on Twitter before, like, if you play any dubstep tonight, the trans family are gonna sit on the floor, and oh you know, <laughs> when you throw down a challenge like that, like you you kind of have. To, so I was thinking, like, well, you know what? If you want to sit down on a fucking piss stained floor covered in puke, <laughs> like if you hate two minutes of dubstep that much well like be my fucking guest um so no now it doesn't feature in my set but i think like i i really enjoy the production level of it and um you know i still listen to it i've been en enjoying um like some snails stuff stuff recently yeah. i think i i just have to realize i can enjoy stuff without needing to play it and without needing to make it but again that was a we had to go through the sit down protest part of my life to realize, you know, <laughs> to, to enjoy certain styles as a listener rather than a participant. That's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Going back to the glass ceiling that yes. you're talking about, um, how do you recognize that uh, when someone has put that on you as an artist? And what are some routes to go about that, to go around it? D um, that is a is a very very good question. I like, I think. Say for instance, you're releasing on somebody else's label. I think, I mean one one thing I would definitely watch out for is um, collaborations. And I'll, I'll give you, give an example. One of the biggest tracks I made about six years ago, but it it was the most played track on the Sirius BPM station of the year, really took my career to the next level in America, was a track called Sanctuary. Now, when we did the original promo of the track, one of the top DJs in the world at that point, and I was fuck all at, th at that point, said, this is a great tune. Said, would you be interested in cancelling your promo and doing it as a collaboration? And this, the top five DJ in the world at the time, um, and it'll be me, Feature, it'd be this artist featuring me, me, Gaff Emery. And I was like, wow, amazing, amazing, let's, let's do it. And then a guy I was working with at the time, um, he was like, you know what? He goes, nobody's gonna fucking realize you're even on it. Like he's gonna take all the credit. Like his name's gonna be fucking massive. Like everyone's heard of him and nobody's heard of you. And he, and he was like, I understand it. If there's value he can bring to that track, but essentially he's gonna take your track, put his name on it, take all the credit and you're going to be fucking forgotten. So fortunately I did listen to that advice and I kept it for myself. And if I'd given that track away as a collaboration, it would have probably, I didn't make a track as good as that for two years. So it would have sent me back um, two years of my career. So I think you always want to look at somebody's motivation. If somebody says to you, hey, let's work on something, do they have like value to bring? So for instance, if I was to, co to collaborate with you and you sent me something, I was like, so you know what, like your beats are fucking dope, but your melody is like really not there. Let me write you a new melody and see if you like it more than the one you've written. That's bringing value because I'm really good at writing melodies. Um, if I were to go, hey, it's a good track. 
let me get it mastered and then put my name on it, um, <laughs> and, it, and, it and it'll be featuring you, then I think the alarm bells um, the, the alarm bells have to ring. I mean, do you have a specific example or are you kind of thinking um, hypothetically kind of, kind of in the future? In the future, yeah. Okay. Um, I think your gut feeling will tell you a lot in these circumstances as well. I just think like the default setting for most dance music artists is they want people underneath them. They don't want those people to get above them. And for me, that genuinely is the fucking opposite. Like, say some of the things we talk about today helps you guys, one of, say, say one or two of you guys, to have the biggest fucking two years, and in two years' time you're headlining a fucking festival, and I'm below you, I'll shake your fucking hand and say, well fucking done, and I hope that some of the advice I gave you helped you make it there. Like, I'm totally, like, like not that way, just because that, to me, feels the right way to be. And there are other people like that, you know, Skrillex is amazing at nurturing other artists and never and I think he's confident enough in who he is not to have those sorts of attitudes. But I think most people like will have that glass ceiling attitude because that's the attitude people have with them. And it's like if a kid, you know, gets bullied at home, they go to school and bully other kids. Like if you get stamped down on your way up, when you get up there, your default setting is to stamp down on the people below you. So I just think question people's motivations and don't necessarily think just because somebody's a bigger artist than you that working with them is the right thing to do what's in it for you what's in it for them and if it's mutually beneficial fucking awesome and if it seems to be benefiting them more than it's benefiting you that's when you start to ask questions thank you mm. yes where does the uh, or when does the lyric part of the process come in for you i know you've worked with like london door and you know do you you, have you really perfected lyric writing or do you kind of look I'm, like I'm awesome? terrible at lyric writing. T to be honest, for me, there are, I mean, this is going to sound like ridiculously basic, but this is the way I say it. For me, there are two sorts of lyrics. Ones that are offensively bad and all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so if some, and you know, when I'd hear people go like, oh my God, I love the track. The lyrics are so amazing. For me, like it, it was always just something like that was, that was very much on, on the fringes. As I've got older, I've got more and more into lyrics, but I really was like never, never used to be into them. Um, I've been lucky to work with some people that had already written amazing lyrics. So Hands was a great set of lyrics by London, Concrete Angel with Christina, fucking fantastic set of lyrics. And it was, I was like, wow, these lyrics really are pretty good. Like I think the lyrics are, are, are a big part of this, but I'm not particularly good. It, it was only on the last album when I started getting into the lyric writing and coming up with ideas and usually it was a case of me kind of like you know the track um far from home on, on my last album i sort of half wrote the lyrics to that but essentially i wrote i write lyrics in a very basic literal way i.e i am far from home i am in china and it feels strange and then like a proper lyricist will go yes let's make that a little bit less literal and turn your concept into a song so um it's an area i kind of suck at but i know to pick people that are good at it which is also an important thing be i think being self-aware enough to know that you're probably not good at everything so you double down on what you are good at you work out what you do well and you pour all of your energy into that, and then the shit that you're not good at, rather than trying to fix that weakness, that chink in your armour, just work with somebody that is good at it. Much easier and much more efficient. Any question? Yes. How, how do you connect with songwriters, and what kind of advice do you have for everybody in the room who are producers that want to get out there and, and connect with songwriters? <clears throat> Um, for me, I'm really fortunate in that my sister, who is also my manager, um, her background is songwriting. She was an acoustic singer-songwriter that went around the pubs of London for years before she came to manage me. So she has an amazing ear for good songwriters. Um, she's an amazing a and and I've been lucky enough that she's really found most of the great songs I, I've, I've got originally came through there even when they were ones that i co-wrote she'd bring me a songwriter and go hey <clears throat> you know i found this girl singing in a pub she's really fucking good she doesn't know anything about electronic music do you want to write a song with her so that so i've kind of been lucky there um i think for you guys like if, without connections it's just about fucking hustle it's being out there it's being on soundcloud it's finding people who you're excited by and i think 
this applies to every area, not just songwriting. Like, if you're not getting told no, you're not aiming high enough. So don't just work with the people that approach you and go, hey, let's do something together. You want to be pitching for those people that are a little bit above where you are. So it's like, you want to be going for songwriters, you go, yeah, you know, like that, she's got a great fucking voice and I'd, I'd, I'd love to work with her, but I don't think I can get her, you know, because she's like already at a pretty high level. Those are the people you need to fucking go for because yeah, nine times out of 10, you're gonna get a no. One time out of 10, you're gonna get a yes. And those one time out of 10s are the ones that change your fucking life. So don't take the easy options. Don't take the people that are always in front of you. Like sometimes do, sometimes like it just fucking falls into your lap and you just find a great fucking songwriter and it, everything is easy. But usually it's a little bit more difficult and it's about the hustle. Another question that I got asked yesterday was, um, when is it time to get a manager? Which is, a, I think, a loaded question, but what's your perspective on that? I think it comes down to the conversation we had about branding. Um, I'm just interested, how, how many people have, does anybody in this room have a manager? No. <laughs> that's, no, I'll tell you, that's a good thing, because I think, like, there's a time to get a manager and it's time when you, you need to know why you want a manager. And the same goes to having an agent. Like I've met a lot of people who are like, yeah, you know, I, I really need, like, need to get myself an agent. And I'm like, why? Like, what is the purpose of, of you getting an agent? So for me, I've changed agents, for instance, three or four times in my career. And there's always been a very specific reason why. It's never been just for the sake of going to a bigger company or whatever. But Four years ago, I was with a European agent, but I was moving to Los Angeles, so I wanted somebody who was based in the LA market, who understood North America, because that's what was blowing up. So I changed from a European agent to an American one. Very specific reason, very specific result that I wanted to get out of it. And I think that's the way you have to approach every single decision. Um, I think with a manager, if you feel there's something you're missing that a manager can add and you know exactly what you expect a manager to do, then do it. But don't do it for the sake of it. And um, I think an agent is, is, a, is, a, also is you've got to look at that in the same way. Um, I think the hard thing with managers and agents is this. To get a good one, you already need to be doing well usually like you know there are some managers which will work off potential they'll see the potential i think that's that's great but like a lot of the good ones they already want to see you doing shows they already want to they want to see like half of the work has, has been done already and then at that point you're kind of going well i'm already fucking like there so like like why do i really need a manager so it's tough and i think you've literally got to look at it like circumstance by circumstance basis what can they give to you that you don't already have and if you have a manager and they're like, look, I'm going to go and fucking hustle for you and I'm going to go and approach every fucking songwriter going and I'm going to send like 30 emails a day to get you the best fucking collaborations and I'm going to go and meet all the promoters in the Los Angeles market and I'm going to get you fucking gigs so you're out there doing stuff. Okay, that's a decent plan, but you've got to know what's their plan, what are they going to bring, what are they going to give to you. Don't think just because you're getting a manager, it's a career boost because it's not. Hell yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, what's it like playing EDC? <laughs> <laughs> do you want the gloss they were press answer or do you want the truth? True. Look, here's the thing about these big these big festivals, and like some of you like may like guess this already. There's a lot of fucking pressure. A serious amount of, of pressure. And like is it amazing to look out and see like that number of people yeah it, it's fucking incredible um but you have to like when you're playing like like a big stage at edc and i've been lucky enough to do the main stage once and other big stages like like four or five times like your entire week is leading up to that moment you're thinking about your set you're thinking about your production you know loads of your friends are there your agents there your managers there your family's there the internet's watching potentially millions of people watching online that is an insane amount of fucking pressure there's also a lot of things that can go wrong you can stop the wrong player you can pick up the mic and say the wrong fucking thing like you know but also the production the, the fireworks that you've paid extra for may not go off the fucking co2s will get bust one edc we did three three years ago the led wall didn't work just didn't turn on it was friday 
and um, the company that put in the LED wall had issues, and it literally never turned on. We'd spent a week programming visuals for that oh set, God, and we wow. didn't get to use any of them, mm. like nothing. Oh. And for the four hours before the set, I was in the hotel, my tour manager's texting me, bit of an issue, LED wall's not working. And he's like, they're trying to fix it. Hour later, is it fixed? No. Hour later, is it fixed? No. And that was when I got there, and he's like, there's not going to be an LED wall. And I was like, right, okay. And, and rehab was before me, and, and he came off, and he was like, fucking bullshit, the fucking LED wall's not working. <laughs> and I, I probably would have been like that way too, and I had to make a conscious decision to go like, you're still playing fucking EDC, put a smile on your face and enjoy it. So I think the, one, the earlier EDCs I did and the really big festivals, I literally would hit this moment about 10 minutes before the end when I realized nothing was gonna go wrong, and I could enjoy it. And then I have 10 minutes of going, yes, isn't this amazing? And then it's the end. Because <laughs> you're, you're only playing for an hour. Hour, hour, goes, re hour goes really fucking quickly. And um, it, it almost like your, and your primary concern becomes getting the thing out of the way and doing a good job and, and basically not fucking up and giving your best possible performance as opposed to enjoying the moment. Now, after doing like quite a lot of big festivals, I've become a lot better at slipping into the moment and enjoying it. Still gonna take me fucking 20 minutes though, but you, instead of like 50 minutes, 20 minutes in, cause your head is going through so many, like your mind will be running at a million miles an hour. And then 20 minutes in, I can kind of take a little step back and a little voice in my head goes, you're playing fucking EDC. <laughs> and there's, and there's 30,000 people out there and you dreamed about this for a decade and you're never gonna, you'll never do this set again. You only ever live that fucking life experience once, so fucking enjoy it. But it's surprisingly tough. So I think when you guys get to doing things like EDC or big festivals, just remember that and don't beat yourself up for not in, for like when you first do it, not enjoying it. Because I'll tell you now, you won't fucking enjoy it. Or, you, or the way to enjoy it is to get blackout drunk, but then you're not going to give your best performance. So you have to. You have to make a very conscious decision. Do I want to get fucked up and I'll have a blast? They may never bring me back, but I'll have a blast. <laughs> or do I want to give an or do I want to give an incredible performance? I choose giving the best performance I can potentially give, which impacts my enjoyment from time to time. I'll tell you the best one, which, and I wish they all did this. Coachella is exactly the same weekend one, weekend two. So weekend one, you've got the fucking nerves, but then weekend two, you go and do exactly the same thing again, same set time, same stage. So. This weekend two, you enjoy immediately because you've already done it. So um, long answer, and I'm sorry if it. Uh, no, it hey, you know what to expect now when you come to do your first major festival. All right, awesome, <laughs> that's all the time we have, you guys. Let's